But when you take Boston as a city of nearly 700,000 people and you put us in the region, now we become a region, a greater Boston region of nearly 2.1 million people. And that changes the way that we deliver services. That changes the way that we look at economic development. That changes the way that we look at housing. That changes the way we look at education. That changes the way we look at a whole host of different issues that we're dealing with in the city of Boston. Good morning and welcome to Boston, You're My Home, getting to yes on housing. Thank you all for coming this morning. I'm Renee Loth. I'm editor of this fine publication, Architecture Boston Magazine. It is the quarterly ideas publication of the Boston Society of Architects. Every issue has a theme, and the theme of the current issue is housing. We have, it's chock full of ideas, creative ideas from architects, designers, and policy um, folks um, to increase the supply of housing, uh, lower the cost while still uh, maintaining design excellence. And I hope that by the end of this morning, we'll all be a little bit more optimistic about our um, ability to achieve uh, our housing goals in the city because I don't think we'll be getting very much help from the federal government. Um, we do have a terrific panel today uh, to help get us there. An architect, a developer, a member of the building trades, and a public policy leader, sort of the full circle of the, the housing picture. My role here this morning is just to introduce the panelists um, and to who will each make a presentation of about 10 minutes each, I hope. Uh, and then I'll come back and facilitate a general conversation among all of us panelists. Um, and then I'll come back um, and uh, we'll have questions and answers from the audience. Uh, we are honored today by the presence of the mayor of Boston, Martin Walsh, who has agreed to stay with us for about an hour. Um, so I will make a special plea to our panelists to keep your remarks succinct so that we might be able to uh, include the mayor in the uh, general panel discussion. Um, I think he'll be slipping out right before the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to get right into the introductions and, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you so much. Tamara Roy is the current president of the Boston Society of Architects and a principal at Stantec. Her portfolio includes luxury, mixed uh, market, and affordable housing, um, and also the Yotel, which is the new micro hotel on Seaport Boulevard. Uh, she is the uh, chief proponent of the uh, housing typology formerly known as the micro unit, um, is now called the urban housing unit, or Yuhu. Um, and she has received her master's degree uh, in uh, urban design and architecture from, excuse me, I think it's Berlage, Berlach, Berlach Institute, um, which is an international think tank in Amsterdam. This is useful to know because she lived there in 300 square feet um, with her husband and baby. So she walks her walk. Um, Kimberly Sherman Stamler is president of Related Beal, where she's responsible for overall management of the firm. She has 17 years of real estate experience, but most notably for this panel discussion this morning, she was um, uh, central to the conceptualizing and financing of Parcel 1B over by Haymark, over by the North Station, which is the largest affordable workforce housing development in Boston in the last 25 years. And it just had its topping off ceremony last week. Um, in addition, she sits on the boards of uh, the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy and Habitat for Humanity of Greater Boston. Mark Ehrlich is the Executive Secretary Treasurer of New England Regional Council of Carpenters, a 19,000 member organization, about 9,000 of whom are here today. Um, he is a member of Carpenters Local 40. He has been since 1975. He's worked as an apprentice, a journeyman, foreman, and superintendent. Uh, special thanks to the Carpenters for organizing this this morning. He's also on the, um, a member of the Boston Zoning Board of Appeals. I think that's still accurate. And, um, Mass Inc., the public policy think tank, and he's the author of two books on uh, labor issues published by Temple University Press. Um, Martin J. Walsh, he is the 54th mayor of the city of Boston. He's going to offer opening remarks for us. A former eight-term state representative from Dorchester. He's also former head of the Boston Building and Construction Trades Council, which represents skilled workers in 16 different uh, trades, from the iron workers to the pipe fitters. As Boston's mayor, he has set an ambitious agenda of both planning and housing uh, with the goal of creating 53,000 new units of housing by 2030, the city's 400th birthday. Let us all welcome Mayor Walsh.
Thank you very much, Renee, and thank you for, for that nice introduction. I want to thank also the Boston Society of Architects uh, and the entire building community represented that's here today. Um, we need everyone's help at the table if we're going to uh, continue the progress and take it to the next level. Uh, today's panel is a great example of that, and I want to thank them all. I want to thank Tamara, Kimberly, and Mark, Kim and Mark for, for their great work and, and each what they do respectively. Um, these are leaders of organizations that have stepped up uh, with the types of collaboration that it takes to, to get workforce housing built in our city. I also want to thank uh, today, we have a few people from the city here. I'm not going to name everyone, but I want to just uh, shout out a couple people. One is Chief of the Environment, Austin Blackman, is with us today. Thank you, Austin, for being with us today. Because as we build, we have to look towards the environment as well. So I want to thank Austin and his team. Uh, we also have uh, Buddy Christopher, the Commissioner of Inspectional Services, with us today, uh, who's in charge of all the building permits and, and making sure that we sign off on all the buildings. So I want to thank you, uh, Commissioner Christopher, for being here with us today as well. And we have representatives from the Department of Neighbor Development, from the Boston uh, BPDA, uh, from the Housing Innovation Lab, uh, from different areas. So I want to thank you all. Um, what was central to our 2014 housing plan was not just a, an ambitious target, but to foster new ideas and new partnerships that we needed to reach the goals and adapt to the changing conditions. Uh, I am pleased to give you an update on some of our results. We set a plan to create 53,000 units of new housing in the city of Boston by the year 2030. The reason we did that is because of the growing population, and, and it seems to be this move into the city of Boston by millennials, uh, but also by baby boomers coming into our city. And we were finding that, that, and we knew that, and many of you in this room knew that, that people were being priced out of the city of Boston and couldn't afford to live here, couldn't afford to buy here, couldn't afford to come here. Uh, to date, we have nearly 19,000 units that have gone into construction including 5,323 5, middle-income units, 3,600 if in 53 low-income units. Nearly 12,000 of those units are completed, including 3,500 middle-income housing, 2,300 middle-low-income housing, and 13,000 more units approved in the pipeline. That is roughly 40,000 units of the, of the plan is either built under construction or in the pipeline. That's a total of $18 billion of new investment. It puts us on a 75% goal uh, way towards our goal, and we're well ahead of the schedule. One of the most positive signs has been the spread of this growth beyond the downtown Boston area into our different neighborhoods. We worked to catalyze this uh, early on with our neighborhood home initiative. We've got hundreds of vacant lots into production for moderate low, moderate and low income buildings. We're now seeing major investments in large developments take shape in several neighborhoods. Our progress has already produced one of the most vital, vital outcomes that we wanted to have. We're seeing rents that have stabilized in the city of Boston for pre-existing housing stock in areas where growth has been high. That means the production of market rate units is meeting the demands and more of our existing stock will stay within the middle income uh, area for people. Uh, and that's a big deal. And we're also watching to make sure that the increase of housing isn't slowing down on our economy. We're keeping an eye on that as well, watching to see that we're not overproducing on the market, something that's really important to some of the developers in this room, that we continue uh, the great trend that we have in the city of Boston. We now have a chance to build on a lot of our progress. Uh, Boston voters approved the Community Preservation Act 74 to 26 percent, which is a good thing. With full community support, we're going to be able to invest in low and moderate income housing while also protecting our open spaces and historic preservation. And it's a great combination. I, know, I think everyone knows what the CPA is, but in case you don't, uh, the CPA is a fund uh, that's a 1% assessment tax on real estate property in the city of Boston. The average homeowner will pay roughly between $18 and $28 additional a year. Uh, that money will be put into a fund. In the first year, we'll be able to collect about $16 million of money. Uh, we're going to get a state match. It, it, it's not dollar for dollar right now, so we'll get about a 25% state match for the first year, but we're going to work with the state to try and get that up to 100% funded so we get dollar for dollar. At least 10% of the community preservation money in the city has to be spent on open space, historic preservation, or housing. Uh, and then the rest of the money gets split up a, a, with a board that's going to be created between myself and the city council that will have representatives on that board. 
Uh, so this is going to ensure that for, for, for a long time in the future, there will be at least 16 million, and that number will go up, obviously, as time goes on, in a fund to be able to go into affordable housing, go into open space and parks. And if you look at Boston, uh, I'm excited about the housing aspect of it. But I, right now, today, I'm a little more excited about the historic aspect of it because we're approaching our 400th birthday as a city. We have many historical sites in our city of Boston that, that, that are in desperate need of repair. This will give us the opportunity to be able to fund some of those repairs. And open space as well, we've made the largest investments in parks history over the last two budgets. So we're going to continue to do that. So I'm pretty excited about that. Another essential factor in moving forward is our revamp of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. A modern and transparent BPDA can do two things that are sometimes thought to be odd. It can make the approval process more efficient and predictable. It can also foster a community process that secures broader input, makes projects better, and achieves genuine buy-in from our neighborhoods. And again, when you think about what the Boston Redevelopment Authority had meant for our city for, for nearly 60 years, uh, it was created to mo move our city forward, created to really build an economy in our city, build a downtown district, and really look at business side of it. And, and what's happened, and for the future, what we have to do is not only develop, but we have to plan for that development. So it's important for us to look differently at that agency to really think about how, do we, how does a building that used to be built and approved through the system, how do we take that building and turn that into a planning opportunity? And that's really what we're looking at with the BPDA, is looking at planning and development and how do we grow as a city. It's a win-win for our city because we've launched Imagine Boston 2030, the first citywide plan uh, whose first draft is going to come out this week, looking at, looking at Boston and what, we're gonna be, what type of city we'll be in the year 2030. We're moving forward on strategic planning areas for growth zones in South Boston and Jamaica Plain, Roxbury. These plans are not, are not spiking density in already built up neighborhood. They're extending neighborhoods into areas that need more life. And we're working on how do we get more predictability for developers to be able to come into an area and able to cut back on some of the, the money they're spending on designing a project, but actually have some of that, that understanding in the forefront so we can put more money into the project. We're also going to be, um, we're also looking at climate change. And certainly, uh, Renee mentioned uh, the federal government with, with, with a lot of support. I have no idea what's going to happen to the federal government, and I don't think anyone in this room does. Certainly, 80%, 84% of Boston, Massachusetts people have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> but given that, we are still committed to the growth that's sustainable and climate ready here in the city of Boston. We know that solving the workforce housing challenge takes more resources and it takes creativity. That's why we formed the, the Housing Innovation Lab right in my office. Marcy and Susan are here. It's exploring ways to lower costs. That includes compact units. We toured a model around the city and showed over 2,000 residents. We're looking at, does that model work for our city? And it's important for us to make sure we get feedback from all of the stakeholders to see how that works. It also includes density bonuses that, that we are piloting in South Boston and Jamaica Plain areas. We're looking at new ways of how to support community land trusts and maintain affordable pricing. We're looking at study, studying accessory dwelling units as a way to create affordable rents. It's important to note that the innovation is more than a design challenge. It's in, in neighborhood context and community consensus as well. So we have to get the buy-in from the different stakeholders. Finally, the regional question. Boston economy is a regional economy. Our housing market is a regional market. We have towns in greater Boston where the market would produce workforce housing if zoning allowed it. We have some work to do on our own zoning as well. But ultimately, we need to, we need to get regional solutions. That means working through the legislative process, working directly with cities and towns, and working with regional planning groups and housing advocates to make sure that we look at the entire region. One way or another, it's going to happen. If you look at Boston's population, officially our population is 650,000 people. When you unofficially, I'd say it's about 673,000 people. We haven't seen that type of growth in our city in, in nearly three decades. There's an opportunity here. But when you take Boston as a city of nearly 700,000 people and you put us in the region, now we become a region, a greater Boston region, of nearly 2.1 million people. And that changes the way that we deliver services. That changes the way that we look at economic development. That changes the way that we look at housing. That changes the way we look at education. That changes the way we look at a whole host of different issues that we're dealing with in the city of Boston. And I know that many cities in, in, in this region are concerned about preserving their character. And we are in Boston as well. The one thing we learned again last week is the world brings challenges whether we like it or not. 
Sometimes in order to preserve your deepest values, we have to adapt. If markets are forced are reducing your economy, economic diversity and reducing your ability to support your family and local businesses, then we certainly know the town's character and the city's character will change. So protecting property value is not the same as protecting character. It's worth remembering that Boston's North End is known as learn all, all over the world for its character. But it was built to, to house low-income immigrant families who had nowhere else to go. That's a good reminder of our true wealth and our true character of the people and of all of our people. If we really want to preserve our city's values, we have to build with all, the need, with all their needs in mind. I want to thank you for being here today for this important discussion. I look forward to having the conversation, and I'm going to sit down now before Renee pulls me. Thank you. So I think we, I want to just talk, um, again, it's only really 10 minutes, but I'm showing a video at the end, so it's really only seven minutes, um, about some of the facts of our Boston housing supply, um, and then what can we do about it. So one of the things that um, is, uh, we found is that two-thirds of our, our um, households in Boston are either one- or two-person households. Um, and yet the housing stock there, the supply, is actually the reverse. It's two-thirds is two, three, four-bedroom units and above, um, rather than studios and one-bedrooms. So what we tried to do is show through these cute animations um, what that means. What does a shortage in small units mean? Um, so you have seniors, actually our largest growing population in Boston, who need to downsize and would like to move to places with elevators, for example. They can't move because they can't find that housing, and so they can't, they can't get families into their housing. Then we have our students and our young workforce, millennials, who I heard yesterday, more millennials live with their parents than live with spouses. Can you believe that? Um, they would like to live alone, but they need to pair up or group up. They can pay much more in rent than a family, and so they price out the family also. And then you have the baby boomers swarming into the city for all this great stuff that our city has to offer. They can pay two, three, four times the rent, and those folks of limited incomes, college debt, get priced out. So it's really partly our housing stock that's making this happen to families. And then again, baby boomers, what happens is since they can't move, they're stuck too <laughs> with their kids and their grandparents. So what we find um, in, in architecture and development is that just the size alone uh, makes family units too expensive to build today. And that you know at normal rates, $4 uh, rental and 300 for construction cost, that three bedroom unit is really expensive and has to rent for a ridiculous amount of money if it's new construction. So that's why we start looking at smaller units for affordability. And we also know that over 50, over 25% of our folks are paying more than half of their income on rent, which is outrageous. So I took a quick look and I think uh, the mayor really already sort of went through these stats on how we're doing. Um, and as he said, we had the goal of 53,000 units, which is 17% additional to what we already have. Um, and we're already a third of that um, after two years, which is incredible. But before we start congratulating ourselves, 2% of that is at the very low income spectrum. 8% of that is below 60% AMI. And then 21% is between 60 and 120, which I thought, that's really great. We're actually doing pretty well in that area. But I thought I'd go on the BPDA website and just see what does that mean, right? And everybody asks, what does 60 to 120% mean? Um, and if you look at the higher ranges of these, which even I can't see from this angle, um, for the single person, that's a person making $82,000 a year. And they're supposed to be able to afford an apartment at $1,650 a month. And you can see as you go through the to the family, also those numbers. And so I think one question um, does become like, we want to, let's not make sure that we're, we're excited about something that actually most of our population would not see as workforce or, or middle income. So I think the, the conclusion really for all of us is we're all trying our best, but that the status quo is 
is um, struggling that we're doing so much luxury and so little um, modest in our car, my car analogy, I'd love to have the, the Prius on the right, um, but instead, and we'd love to have those numbers reversed, where 18% was luxury, that would match more of our, our city, and 82% was modest, but how could we possibly get there? Um, so we're just trying to keep eyes on the prize, um, and the mayor has been doing amazing stuff in this area, pilots, modular, partnerships, land swaps, trying as hard as we can to get those numbers up. And trying to prioritize, I think the next step is really just being, maybe just totally extreme about it, and just saying affordability is, is so important that you know we want to do density bonuses for anything that is up above 20% affordable. Can we lower the union rates for affordable projects? We just push on um, you know, when you're doing, um, trying to get more affordable housing in the city. And this one, crazy idea, could we um, earmark those extra property taxes that we're getting for luxury units? And rather than just spreading them through the city's budget, actually say, let's take from those folks and put it toward the folks that need it. So what can we do? We are doing at the BSA this partnership with the Housing Innovation Lab and DND to do a pilot um, where we're, we're doing compact living for middle income renters. Um, we're, we really want to build this project, not just talk about it. So that's exciting. We did a charrette in the neighborhoods where we taped out a 900 square foot three bedroom unit, which is lower than the, the zoning um, would say is the minimum size. And people actually said it could be smaller. Um, we also have a one-room mansion exhibit, which is at, our, at the BSA now. I encourage all of you to go. Um, so we've heard again, innovative housing is affordable, that it's a small unit with common spaces. So going out, outside of the unit, what are those common spaces? We've mocked up an entire micro-unit building at the BSA, and you can walk through it. It has common spaces, laundry, um, workspace, etc. Um, but what it really does, which is very interesting, is push these sizes really small and lets people experience them. And like the 615 square foot two bed, you can walk around there and say, there is no problem, I could live in this. And that is 400 square feet lower than what our city minimum is. Then lastly, the Yoohoo, um, which I'm going to show the video about, prefabricated, 384 square feet, traveling around the neighborhoods. Um, we also did a design, if people came in and said, this is not for me because I have a family, we did a design on the right where you put two yoo-hoos together and it's a 770 square foot three bed, um, which many people responded very favorably to. And again, on the left, what we're trying to show folks is that this is not about style. It, any modular development can fit into your neighborhood, it just depends on what it's clad with. And so this has been the feedback, one to two percent, People, 2,000 some odd people that toured it said no. The rest said somewhere in the range of maybe a yes. So I'm going to show the video now. And thank you very much. The Yoohoo is a prototype 385 square foot apartment built in partnership with the Mayor's Housing Innovation Lab, the Boston Society of Architects, and Live Light. Its purpose is to gather community feedback about compact living in Boston neighborhoods. The Yoohoo design is based on years of research on small unit living. It has a space for every function, a large entrance foyer, a bed alcove that can be hidden with curtains for more privacy, a wide hallway flanked by a storage closet and a code compliant bathroom, and a living room with a full kitchen and dining area. And what makes the Yoohoo extra special is its many other features that make it seem so much bigger than it is. Let's take a tour. At the entry, the Yoohoo is designed so you can see right through to the large windows in the front. There are hooks for coats, shelves for extra storage, and a place for a bench or other furniture so you can personalize. The bedroom alcove is large enough for a queen-size bed with space to walk around it and a bedside table. Above is a large storage area for whatever you have that needs to be hidden from view. The wide hallway has lots of storage an extra-wide double-door closet big enough for a stackable washer-dryer and a clothing organizer, and storage above for items you use less often. The bathroom has a wide sink area and a large mirror cabinet, with space for baskets or a storage cabinet below, a towel rack, and a walk-in shower, easier for seniors, and it feels like a nice hotel. 
Back in the hall, there is a bookshelf for office supplies, cookbooks, pantry items, whatever you like. And then the main living area is the wow space. Two pull-out sofas make room for guests and provide plenty of seating. The dining table can easily transform from a desk to seating for up to six people for a dinner party. And with one entire wall of glass and doors that open to a balcony, the room feels large and bright. Most people are afraid that compact living means mini fridges and living like a student. Not here. The kitchen has a two burner stove. Who's used more than two burners? Lots of cabinets and shelving, a large sink, a full size refrigerator and a pantry, as well as a microwave convection oven. Now here's what some of you whose visitors had to say. How do I explain it? I don't know, it's small, but it's like spacious at the same time. Like it's tiny, but there's more than enough space. Like you usually don't find that very often. You know, I would love to see this happen, you know. And I've never seen anything like this. This is the first time, you know, something like this coming into Mattapan. So it would definitely be um, a great, great, you know, great project to definitely see, um, you know, moving forward, you know. Um, the fact that I'm still a student and you know, a lot of people that I know are still living at home with their parents and stuff, and they're looking to get out on their own. This would be a great way to start out. I could have company in. I could have, you know, people come in, but they're not going to stay over. It's just for me. You know? I love it. I love it. I love the idea, really. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Kim Sherman Stamler, president of Related Beal. Uh, thanks for having me today. I'm thrilled to be talking about um, our project and our developments in conjunction with um, the mayor and um, Mark and Tamara. Or Tamara. I, um, I'm really excited about Parcel 1B, and our company has been excited about this project for a long time. But truthfully, um, our, our company is built on affordable housing, and we're always looking to get into workforce affordable and various types of housing in the cities that we build in. And although I'm going to talk about 1B and how complex and complicated it was, um, it was, it was able to get done and get done in a short period of time because of everybody together that was working on this project. So I'll flip through the slides. My presentation is kind of short, but I'll probably talk a lot through it. Um, but one of the notable factors is, as we sit up here and we talk today about how you build affordable housing and how you build workforce housing, and it's a dilemma for cities throughout the country. The one defining factor that I found um, in working on Parcel 1B is the great desire to have workforce and affordable housing in the city of Boston and in the state of Massachusetts. It's something that people talk about all the time, but in my experience and in our experience actually doing 1B, our, our coming to the table with various city, state, and local federal agencies to get the project done, I think, was a defining factor in this project. You'll see that we Sorry. Oh. Oh, there we go. I know you can't see it. I know, that's okay. That's okay. I know, I know it. Um, and so I will talk about that throughout the, throughout, the, throughout the presentation. But, you know, when people talk about the challenges, challenges of can it be done, the answer is yes, it can be done. And I think that our project is one of the more, more complex projects for various reasons. But I think that if everybody didn't get into the room wanting and willing to get this project off the ground, um, it wouldn't have gotten done. I don't think it was just us sort of as developers. So just to identify the site, it's located in the Bullfinch Triangle um, in Boston, in downtown Boston. It is one of the parcels that was born out of the Big Dig, and our particular parcel was a land assemblage of mass dot land on a long-term lease and a private sliver of land that we ultimately combined and made one parcel. We are also, as a company, building in the North End. We're building residences on, on um, Lovejoy Wharf, and we built Converse's headquarters right across the street. So in that neighborhood, we're building about a million square feet, call it, and it was, we wanted to identify a site that we could build workforce and affordable housing in Boston, and this was sort of a great site for us to do it on. Um, this project, Parcel 1B, was originally contemplated in 2007 as, um, 
as an office building with a either two office buildings and a hotel component or hotel and residential. And it went through different iterations throughout um, 2007, really to 2016, based on the market at the time, the developer at the time. And ultimately, at the end of 2015, we as a company came in to buy um, what was a planned and programmed and sort of approved project, but we did not want to do the same program as the original developer. We wanted to do 100% um, workforce housing with the hotel component. So just for some project stats, it's about 500,000 square feet. The current program is a 220 key hotel, 239 workforce and affordable units, 10,000 feet of retail and 220 parking spaces. We're building over 93 and we had constraints in terms of going below because going below is the highway. So we go five feet below and then we, everything else is above grade. So when we, dis, when we came into the project and changed, well, this, is, this is actually the original program in 2007, over time it iterated through various different programs and then we ultimately came to ours. But be, because of the, um, sorry, just, I'll lean this way. Because of the location itself over the oh, over 93, we had some particular um, particular challenges. In addition to the um, complexity of building, because it was a mass dot parcel with the private assemblage in an area that was had both city and state jurisdiction, we also have federal jurisdiction because it's over 93, and, and the federal highways has to sign off on everything. So when I was saying earlier that everybody had to come together, it was a little bit of a domino effect while concurrently working to get this project done in terms of permitting, approvals, redoing the um, interior units to get more affordable units in, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the biggest sort of smoking gun was we had to get it all done within a year. So in 2015, by the end of 2015, our financing would go away, our, our, our long-term lease with the state would go away, and a lot of the benefits and the financing that we needed had to get done in the end of 2015. So everyone in this room is very familiar with building and what does it take to get a project re-permitted essentially, um, refinanced and redesigned in 12 months when you are literally putting a shovel in the ground 12 months later. So. Um, the other big thing was because we were buying a project that was both residential and hotel, it was great that it had a residential component, but we had to make tweaks to the residential component of the project to include three bedroom units, and that was something that we wanted to do. So the original plan was studios ones and twos. We wanted to add three, and of the 239 units, we have um, 24 three bedroom units to accommodate families in downtown. So just to talk a little bit about um, Oh, and that's, that's the, um, one of our drawings that I think almost everyone in our office has on their bulletin boards, just to remind everybody else in the office of the project that they're working on, that, that that's the ground, you know, two, uh, two major directions of the highway. So just to talk a little bit before I get to this slide and some of the benefits of the workforce housing location, I just want to talk briefly about the, the, the things that made this project happen. So I think that a lot of people feel that it's impossible because of land cost or construction cost or time periods for permitting or d different jurisdictional requirements. But one thing with Parcel 1B, and I'll talk through a little bit of the financing and the programming in a minute, is every single bit counted. So this project is four components, hotel, parking, retail, residential. But within the residential, it's actually two components, workforce and affordable. And within the parking, it had to be split for just different, different sort of financing reasons. So this project is actually seven different components that benefited from a 121A structure from the city of Boston, but then also is a long-term ground lease with the state of Met, with the Commonwealth. So because of the long-term ground lease, because of the 121A, and because of the components, it's actually a 28 entity sort of cake of seven tier, three tiers of seven entities. And the only reason that I bring that up is because, again, it's very complex, but it was able to get done. So the benefits that we got and the benefits that we were seeking where this project could not have been done without is the 121A gave us a little bit of breathing room on the real estate taxes for certain components, the affordable and workforce component of the project. We received a state tax credit and that was a critical component of the project. Um, I just want to note that the state tax credit um, currently is going through 2020 with the allocation that I think is $20 million that, that could possibly reset. And that was a critical component to our project and that was an important piece of getting this to work because again, every dollar counted. So anything from a million to $10 million made this project work and anything without, and, any, and not having that, that extra, dollar, the extra dollars to infuse into the project um, was, was sort of make or break. Um, we had affordable housing trust fund, trust fund money, and we were very appreciative of that. 
our company was building sites across the street that we had committed to voluntary contributions of affordable housing b before we even got involved in 1B. Our 131 Beverly project and our Converse headquarters project, we made voluntary contributions that ultimately got used for personal 1B, but we hadn't planned on that at the time. There, were, there was another developer building in this city that needed production units that we put onto our site, so we were able to do that. And then we also um, financed the project with um, a portion of um, tax, exempt, bo tax exempt bonds that also allowed us to get a federal housing tax credit. The, com the, the financing sources, and our, our com we had a conventional loan in the hotel, and our company put in a, a, a bunch of equity, with, in, including with the partner for the hotel. If I put it on an org chart, I mean, I started to do an org chart, and it's blinding, and I started to do a list, and that's equally as blinding. But the reason that I bring that up again is because every contribution counts. And so I, I really sort of applaud the mayor on the CRA, and I applaud everybody's interest in that because those are meaningful dollars that really go into projects and make them work. And the dollars are so critical that it's make or break. And when you get that funding and you are able to push a project forward, you can do very complex projects like ours. Um, the other thing, too, for our project was we, we really thought that this location was a terrific one for affordable and workforce housing where you're right in the heart of downtown Boston. So that means access to work via public transit. It means you can walk. It means that you've got the public schools right there, and it means that your commuting time is less. And um, in our particular neighborhood, we have a supermarket, and we have all the uh, neighborhood conveniences right there for people to um, you know, live, work, and play. This is the ground floor. Um, the bottom is Beverly Street, and so you'll see that there, the hotel component is along Causeway Street, and the residences are further back on Beverly with a parking entrance bifurcating the two. And just to go over some of the um, some of the programs, we did not we didn't change the program, and we did not change the amenities. We actually added a few. You'll note our dog spot in bullet two, but um, we we have a um, you know we have party rooms and a fitness center and amenities and parking and everything else that you would want. We have children's rooms for families that are coming in, you know, and with growing families that are that are going to use spaces. And like Tamara was saying, you know, it's very important to take advantage of space outside of your own home, and we were, we were able to create those spaces. So this is, I'm, and I'm bummed because I did not, we, did, we had our topping out and I did not include a picture from the topping out, so um, I'll have to come back next year. But the, uh, the views from the, from the balcony, and it, again, we're 14 stories above the Greenway, above the, above the Central Artery Tunnel, so we're facing um, south and north, so we've got tremendous views. This is an image of our party room, our, our health club. Our party room overlook, has a terrace and then overlooks the Greenway. Um, and it's a sort of a highly amenitized building with 239 units. So you're going to have over 500 people coming in and out every day. Um, and just to finish, we're really excited about this project. We're really proud of this project. But like I started with, I think the one defining factor was the city and the state want to see this done. And to be able to get into a room with 25 city, state, and public agencies and roll up your sleeves in 12 months to get this done, I'm not so sure how, how much that can be replicated in other areas, but I, you know, I certainly know that it can re be replicated here. And um, you know, we're looking forward to doing more. So thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark Ehrlich. I'm the head of the New England Carpenters and uh, uh, very honored to be part of this panel um, and with the mayor. Uh, this is an exciting period of time in this, the history of the city of Boston and there's a really ambitious effort across a whole lot of lines uh, to try to do something about the housing crisis to deal with the population growth that the mayor referred to so that Boston can continue to be the uh, international cosmopolitan city that it is. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit different than I think what has typically been uh, discussed as part of uh, how to deal with the housing crisis. I'm actually going to talk about the workforce that builds the housing, about the production of housing and what the issues are there. And I'm going to try to deal with some what I would uh, call myths and realities. Um, the, the information that is in uh, my presentation is based on a series of reports that have come out over the last couple of years. I'm sure some of them you're all familiar with, other ones you may not be. They refer both to Boston and New York City. And the reason I'm including New York is because New York is, is, has some, some of the same challenges. It's a growing city. They're trying to build more housing. Uh, <clears throat> but the other reason, quite candidly, is because since the recession, uh, much of the residential industry, much of the housing that is being built in New York is being built 
on a non-union basis, and there are people in the development community who are arguing that that should serve as a model for what happens in Boston. So I'm going to start with, uh, uh, I don't know if Tim Logan is here, but um, uh, last year Tim did a, uh, an article about um, uh, uh, the Northeastern report card on housing. And it uh, talked about the drivers that were going uh, in the industry that were, they were increasing costs. And what was interesting was I had read the report and I'd read Tim's article. Tim is a terrific reporter. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about the price of land driving costs, and there was nothing about the price of labor. But the headline said, land labor prices reduce prospects for affordable residence of study fines. So I called Tim up, and I said, how did that happen? And so he threw the headline editor under the bus. <laughs> now, that, that, and that's fine. Um, but the real point is, why did that happen? And it happened because it had become the conventional wisdom, because there was a series of forums and op-eds in the business uh, journals that said that what was really driving uh, costs was, um, was that union labor uh, cost too much in, in the city of Boston. So um, uh, what I'm going to do is actually talk about what these studies actually say, as opposed to what a headline editor might have interpreted. And the reality is in, it's very similar in both Boston and New York City. Uh, construction, the hard costs, labor, materials, overhead profits for the contractors, subcontractors, et cetera, is 59% of the total development costs. The soft cost, the, you know, the list is there, design, financing, et cetera, et cetera, about 22%, and land is at about 18%. Um, but what is really interesting is when you look at these studies and they talk about what are the factors that are increasing costs and making it difficult to build non-luxury housing in the city of Boston, whether it's workforce, market rate, affordable, uh, in any case, I mean, the luxury housing, the, the rents are, are so outrageous that you could pay anybody anything and it wouldn't matter. Um, but for the, for the bulk of the housing that we're talking about here today, what's interesting is over the last decade, the cost of land has gone up four times, 4.4 times faster than the rate of inflation. Land remediation and infrastructure has gone up five times faster than the rate of inflation, and financing costs have gone up 5.4 times faster than inflation. And labor and materials, the, which make up the bulk of the hard costs, have actually only increased three-fifths of 1% as fast as the rate of inflation. So when you compare them, sort of summary over this last decade, land costs have gone up an uh, aggregate of 42%, and construction costs have only gone up 6%. So I mean, this really runs counter to kind of uh, what has been the perception and the argument of a few people in the development community who have suggested that it's, it's labor costs that are real, the real problem. Um, the other side of that is what happens when you don't um, use people who get decent wages and benefits. And the residential industry around the country has become the wild west of the construction industry. I'm talking about the private, uh, the private residential industry. In New York, it's largely mid-rise and high-rise because of the nature of density. In Boston, once you get outside of the downtown core, uh, into the neighborhoods, into the, uh, into the other cities and towns surrounding Boston, it's the typical design, as you all know, is wood frame, uh, five stories or four stories over podium. That's the multi-unit uh, design of choice that we see uh, in today's world, unless you're building a Yoohoo, of course. Um, and uh, uh, what is interesting is a study that the Fiscal Institute did in New York that looked at the residential market and estimated that 36% of construction workers in the residential industry are employed illegally. Now, what does that mean? That means either they're paid off the books completely, paid cash, um, and treated as kind of invisible workers uh, in, the, in the economic scheme, or they're misclassified as independent contractors when they, in fact, are functioning as employees. Now, why do contractors do this? It's very simple. In a highly competitive market where materials cost roughly the same for everybody, if you're trying to save costs on labor and you pay people cash or as independent contractors, you save roughly 25 to 30 percent on labor costs. You're not paying the mandated state and federal taxes. You're not paying workers' compensation insurance in a highly dangerous industry. And, it, and it, the, the incentive to do that that is obvious uh, when people are looking at the bottom line and the dollars are, are hard to find. Um, interesting, this study pointed out that in the affordable housing industry in New York, the percentage of construction workers working illegally actually rose to two-thirds. That's a lot of people. 
Um, and this is a national problem. If you go south of the Mason-Dixon line, this way of operating is unfortunately the rule rather than the exception. What does that mean? It's tax and insurance fraud. People are uh, getting out of their, their obligations to pay taxes, to provide insurance for their workers. It is what is known as wage theft, pure and simple. And the workers who are working in those conditions are increasingly immigrant workers and increasingly undocumented uh, uh, immigrant workers who, because of their uncertain legal status, are not in a position to complain uh, or try to change the, uh, the, the dynamics in that industry. Um, this is uh, Beth Healy, some of you may have seen, did a months-long investigative uh, piece that was on the front, pa front page of the Globe uh, two months ago about immigrant workers in the, in the current construction boom filling uh, the gap. And this is largely in the multi-unit wood frame residential industry, the very projects that we are talking about. That is where this is occurring. Um, the article uh, talked about uh, that these, these are workers uh, I, you know, if you haven't read the article, I would encourage you to go back and look at it. It's very thoughtful, a lot of horror stories in it about individuals, human, kind of human interests, but also generally the, the nature of what uh, it is to work. And what she pointed out uh, in the article was that for, for many of these companies, the reality is that it's so pervasive and it's so off the books that it's very difficult for state and federal uh, authorities to really uh, crack down and solve the problem. And so it is basically a bet that these contractors, subcontractors make that the chances of getting caught are minimal, the fines are not that substantial. And so from a simply economic point of view, it may, it's, it's, smart, uh, it's smart business to, to operate this way because you can save a lot of money. Um, what are the, the, the consequences for, for the individual workers who are in this situation? Again, I'm referring to New York because there's been more work done on this, uh, but the dynamics are very much the same. Uh, last year, uh, there was a front page story in the Times about safety and construction and what's going on. And this is kind of, these numbers are scary. Building activity uh, increased by 11%, but construction accidents were up nearly five times that amount, 52%. And it is because of the growth of the underground economy in the, the uh, construction environment. And again, a majority of these deaths and injuries involved undocumented immigrants. So to kind of look overall at you know, these cost factors, I just want to point out um, a couple of things, which is on the union side, that union wage contractual increases throughout the trades uh, over the last decade, the increases have really been relatively modest, considering we have a boom. They've been in the 1% to 3% range. And that, I would like to remind people, is not just for wages, but wages and benefits. It's for total compensation. So the 3% increase is really, uh, is again, considering the, the boom that we have, I would characterize as modest. The carpenters uh, have had, we, even with all of this, we recognize that the residential market is a different market than the commercial institutional market. And for 20 years, we have had a rate for uh, wood framing for these projects that I'm talking about that is 62% of the commercial institutional rate for the, on most projects in, in the city and, and the region. Um, that has allowed us to be on virtually all of the wood frame uh, multi-unit residential jobs in the city of Boston and many of them in the surrounding communities. Uh, many, many of the other trades are either considering uh, actions like this or adopting similar programs or f trying to figure out other ways of subsidizing costs. But one of the studies, and this one again for New York, and uh, you know, drawing on New York uh, be simply because there have been a certain amount of more academic research done there, um, this is by a former BRA economist, John Avalt who says that with construction worker wages comprising 17% of construction industry billings in the city, construction costs representing about 60% of total development costs, it means that construction workers' wages are estimated as 10% of the total cost. What does this mean? This means that when people try to save money and to make the argument that, um, that w workforce housing, market rate housing, affordable housing should be done uh, on the backs of the people who are actually building it, a, that's not, that's not right, either morally or ethically, and B, it actually is not justifiable in terms of the, the, uh, the economics. We have made a, a choice that this, this, this session is called Getting to Yes, 
uh, or that's sort of one of the themes. And so the, by having the residential rate, we believe that that's our contribution. Uh, we think that everybody, all the players uh, who are involved in the industry, if we're really going to tackle the workforce housing crisis, need to sort of step up and make similar kinds of agreements. And the city has been an absolute model of leadership around this under this mayor about really trying to, to, to understand what it's going to take to accomplish the incredible goal of 53,000 units. The final thing I would say, and I'll close with this, is we're talking about workforce housing. Well, who's going to live in it? When you talk to the people who are marketing that housing, you're talking about teachers, firefighters, nurses, construction workers, that's, who, that's the demographics that these units are aimed at. So isn't it a little bit ironic to think that you would build these projects with construction workers who can't afford to live in them because they're being paid cash and minimal wages with no benefits? So I would argue that when we think about the myths and realities that the, that, that the workforce that is actually building these units has to be considered as one of the key components of a successful public policy program. Uh, we're really excited um, that this city is one, especially in today's environment in the last week, that this city is one of the cities that has this progressive vision of building housing and that it is a strong union city and we're very much part of the solution and we are grateful for that. Thank you very much. Okay, well, that was really great, um, and it was wonderful to have all of the different representatives of the total picture, you know, rep, uh, represented here, architecture, design, development, financing, labor costs, land costs, um, and public policy questions. Um, uh, so I guess, um, you know, the new, in, uh, the new issue of Architecture Boston has all of these really creative ideas for um, increasing the housing supply. Um, but many of them, and you th I'm thinking about, we have uh, suggestions about accessory dwelling units or um, add-on units or uh, rehabbing um, commercial and industrial um, buildings or um, uh, developing projects without parking, which of course adds um, a lot to the cost of a project as well as to the person who owns the car. I mean, when you're trying to make these numbers work, I was interested to learn from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council that you can save $9,000 a family can if you can get rid of your car. And that $9,000 could go to paying the rent and make those, those numbers work. Um, but all of these kinds of um, creative new solutions require zoning changes. And um, these are been really very difficult. And so I'm, I'm going to just throw it at Devin, why not? Um, wh how is that going, uh, efforts to, you know, streamline zoning? How can we, um, you know, fix what's really been a burdensome process? So I think, um, I mean, you heard from the mayor and from the mayor and others that uh, the, the mayor set a very clear goal for how uh, much housing we want to add in the city, 53,000 units by 2030. And we're, we're doing really well on, in terms of uh, progress to date. Um, but the but but 53,000 units is an increase in, in nearly 20 percent in the residential density of, of the city of Boston. So finding space and, and all of you know our city pretty well. We're a pretty built out city, so um, finding the space for that housing is uh, is is a challenge. And I, we got a lot of support for the housing plan when the mayor launched it uh, three years ago, and and continued support. But it's it's one thing to say we need to grow, and it's another thing to say we need to grow next to your house. And so turning um, the conversation from big policy into uh, local development uh, that's happening right next to you is, um, is is a challenging is a challenging process, but it's something that the the Boston Planning Development Agency has jumped right into, and really that's what is behind the mayor's rebranding of that agency to make them more focused on uh, help them be more focused on uh, the connection between planning and development. So. Um, there are two very focused areas that we've, uh, we've been pursuing over the past two years. Uh, the J Jamaica Plain and Roxbury area where we're uh, up increasing d density around the Orange Line and the uh, Dot Ave uh, strategic planning area where, at, where we're, um, and there's industrial use to the west uh, of Dorchester Avenue. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity to add uh, new density. And what I think is interesting about those two uh, planning areas is that they're, they're both very different. Uh, one is uh, very industrial and uh, has relatively um, 
uh, little residential use nearby, and the other is more infill development. And, uh, and because of that, I think we've seen different uh, levels of um, uh, support and engagement for those two projects. It's, it's certainly a challenge, uh, but it's something we've, we've jumped right into, and we're excited to figure out where those, where those next areas are where we can add more housing and we, we can make it to those goals. And the mayor mentioned that the Imagine 2030 uh, plan will be coming out this week, and that identifies some of those additional areas for, for, for strategic growth uh, where, where we, can, we can make it to that 53,000 unit mark and beyond. That's great. You know, I know, Kimberly, in the um, parcel 1B, that parking it was part mm -hmm. of the financial package. In fact, the parking um, provides revenue for the um, full project so as to subsidize and you know, kind of cross-subsidize the, the other costs. But have you, or I'd ask tomorrow this too, um, been able to uh, successfully develop other residential units, maybe in areas close to the transit where housing where parking was either you know not one for one or was below this the standard um, you know parking spaces per unit and what has that been like and has it made a difference so we're currently we're currently under construction across the street from parcel 1b of a project that has doesn't have any that doesn't have any parking um, that's on Lovejoy Wharf, huh. similar to 1B. You can't go below Lovejoy Wharf. We were we were starting from grade and going up. Um, and at Parcel 1B, it, partly inclusive of the hotel component and the guests who are arriving via their car and need a place to park, sure. um, we have a we have a parking parking um, parking garage there. So I think that I, I really think it's building dependent. I think it's location dependent and. Um, I think that different buildings in different locations get different parking situations, and I think that it ends up sort of working out. Yeah. Tomorrow. Can I jump in? So, um, yeah, I think Thank that you. one of the things we're finding um, is that the 2013, um, you know, goal of 53,000 units was sort of a little bit of recession thinking. We thought, how are we ever going to get there? right, by 2030, and we're already a third there. So I think that it's shifted to really not how can we produce all this supply, but who is it for, and how can we redirect it to the people that actually need it. And one of the things that I found um, just kind of surprised me um, when you talk to neighborhoods about density is that when you introduce more affordable development into the, into the building or the project, suddenly the neighborhood loosens up. Right, and I know. I, I mean, I just wanted. Uh, there's one example we were doing with D and D on a D and D site in South Boston on Broadway, where it was 16 units, zero parking, um, basically just almost compact units. And you know, we had one of the smoothest permitting processes ever because the neighborhood was saying we need, you know, a hundred projects like this in our neighborhood. We don't need the ones with all the luxury units. And so I think that sort of. Eyes on the prize here that as we do get into that zoning pro process of trying to shape our city, the more that we can be responsive to the mayor's constituents, the more that we and we can sort of soften or smooth the, the density discussion if we can keep pushing the affordables forward. And I think we just need to keep asking ourselves who is who is this growth for, right? Mm -hmm. And who and who is this growth serving? And and how are we tracking that progress? So certainly income restricted housing guarantees that uh, that the new housing bill will be for low and moderate income families, um, but you know we can't subsidize every unit. So how are the market rate units that we're adding? How are those serving um, low and moderate income families? And we're seeing evidence that in in some neighborhoods that's that's truly working. So we've added a lot of units in the Fenway over the over the past five years. Uh, if you look, take a look at the existing stock of housing, uh, that, that the units that were there before that new housing came online. Uh, rents have uh, actually stabilized or in some cases decreased in that housing over, over the past year. So that's evidence that that, that strategy is working, although that strategy doesn't work in every neighborhood, right? And I think if you ask any, anyone from Chinatown if the uh, addition of luxury units in their neighborhood has helped rents, the answer is absolutely not, right? So we, that's a neighborhood that absolutely needs more income-restricted affordable housing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I live in the city of Boston, and I, I care very much about the quality and the character of the city. I don't want it to become just an, another, uh, you know, I don't know, San Francisco, great city, but um, it's become a place where real people can't live. Um, 
but I also, the mayor mentioned um, that this has to also be a regional solution and that we have, uh, there are responsibilities of some of the outlying communities. I'm not thinking necessarily right now about gateway cities, which are also an option for many people, but, you know, the sort of leafier suburbs that um, surround um, Boston, what is their responsibility um, to step up? I, I, I'm feeling that, um, uh, you know, they could be doing a better job. And I'm wondering whether this is also sort of a zoning question, whether part, uh, 40B, the requirement of affordable housing in um, other communities outside of Boston of the cities, is that working? Um, is there a better solution? Um, is it just moral suasion? Um, how do we get the um, rest of the state uh, to try to meet the, the commitment that the city of Boston has made? Any thoughts on that? jump in, but my colleagues speak to it as well. I think um, well, one thing that's important for everyone to know that nearly 20% of Boston's housing stock is income restricted affordable housing. Uh, we are the national leader uh, among uh, large cities uh, in the percentage of our housing stock that we set up aside as, as affordable. And it has a lot of, to do with the work um, of the people in this room and on this panel. So it's a, we, a long history of many decades of, of, of work in the affordable housing spaces led to that success. And we, we don't plan on slowing down on that at all. And the need is actually greater than that. So we continue to, we'll continue to push. Um, some of our nearby cities and towns don't come right anywhere close to that. And, uh, and you heard the mayors talk about how uh, it's a regional market. Um, and the, that Boston, relative to the, the region, is not the majority of the population by any means. So uh, the, the rent, rent impacts don't stop at city borders. We absolutely need uh, strategies that uh, help uh, spread the costs that, or spread the, the, the distribution of affordable housing and, and spread the, the need for growth across uh, city boundaries. Yeah, Mark, could you um, help us out here a little bit with some of the uh, definitional questions? Um, we're talking about affordable housing a lot, but um, uh, much of what uh, his, uh, we're also discussing here, in which um, Kimberly's uh, company developed, um, is something somewhat above the uh, traditional subsidized level, um, but not luxury housing. Um, it's kind of a middle class um, uh, effort and you know this is another problem that a lot of cities are having that there's you know a very uh, high luxury market and then there's a subsidized you know uh, government uh, subsidized low income housing and there's nothing in between um, that's where m most of our population is what are we doing about that yeah uh, I think if you look at uh, tomorrow's slide about the 82 percent and the 18 um, percent right. there's been an enormous amount of housing that's been built downtown high-rise uh, luxury condos uh, which has accounted for a disproportionate share of the amount of uh, housing that's been built over the last number of years. That uh, process and demand seems to be continuing, but I think the real challenge is for what's going to happen in the neighborhoods. Right. And then you run a, uh, I mean, I live in Jamaica Plain, and she, you know, uh, Devin was talking about the JP corridor and the Dot Ave corridor. I live in Jamaica Plain, I work on Dot Ave. Um, the, uh, it's all about uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the, I think the issue of density is going to be a major public policy issue. Um, there's kind of an automatic reaction against density, but if we're really going to have, uh, uh, whether you call it affordable, whether you call it market rate, workforce, whatever term you use, I would just say non-luxury housing, uh, it's going to have to be the neighborhoods. The design of choice, as I said, is this kind of wood frame over podium, four or five stories. That's been uh, what has been uh, being built and what is being proposed. Um, people uh, in the neighborhoods, mine included, are going to have to deal with the issue of density, and that will be, a, I, I believe, a sort of political and public policy challenge. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, I think, uh, do you have one thing to say? Because I think we're going go I, to go I was just going to talk about the, the Roxbury oh, yeah, Housing ahead. Innovation Competition, yeah. because it was definitely something that, um, you know, we were sort of brainstorming between the Housing Innovation Lab, D&D, &D, and uh, the BSA, was trying to figure out um, if we... Uh, could sort of pilot, just put out there three sites that were in the neighborhood so you knew that they were going to be somewhat wood frame. They weren't gonna, it wasn't going to be a large developer with big inve international investors. It was going to be supporting the sort of small and middle-sized developer community looking for um, not deed-restricted units but moderate income units. And that competition right now is out there and we will just have to sort of wait and see what comes in. Um, but I think that the, the mayor's 
process of what I, I heard Corey Zengabach call this morning, arc of the frontier ideas, <laughs> right? Where there are pilots going on with urban mechanics, with the Housing Innovation Lab, with Imagine Boston, with tactical urbanism, that the sense of experimentation and involving millennials and other folks who have not um, traditionally been, you know, the, the sort of, as you say, getting to yes, the, the sort of no's there, there, there are a whole lot of no's lined up out there about why we're, it's so hard to do workforce housing, but we want to figure out who are the folks who we can work with to get to yes, and so these kinds of pilots are, are really fantastic. Really. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for mentioning that. I thought we'd have a few minutes, we have about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. I'm sure there's a lot of them. Um, there, I, it's difficult for me to see. I think there might be a handheld mic um, circulating on the floor, is there? There will be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you might want to speak into the microphone uh, and state your name because this is being recorded. And you might, there you go. Hi, Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, my name is Katie Faulkner and incredibly excited about the Roxbury uh, housing competition. Looking for a developer partner, so if anybody doesn't have their architect, <laughs> right over here. Um, <laughs> it is a really exciting thing to see. Um, one of the things I'm less um, comfortable with, and I think some of it is my own ignorance, is the the development that's going up, and I'm particularly focusing on what, what you said, Mark, on the uh, JP quarter, the block sizes of these projects are massive. They're not like, um, I think, some of the things tomorrow that we're looking at, where we are looking at existing neighborhoods where we go in and sort of complement the scale. These are blocks like we've never seen before, and they may have models like them in other cities that I'm not aware of, but I would be very interested in knowing the city's thoughts about how those are going to age, because they're, you know, particularly along that Orange Line corridor, I mean, there are mega buildings, and then not a lot of um, kind of what I'd call pedestrian-friendly amenities around them to turn that into a real neighborhood. Thank you. Devin, that's yeah. for you, at least yeah. to start. Uh, so. I think certainly one of the um, the trade-offs is uh, in around cost of construction, right? And I think my colleagues will tell you um, how uh, how the, the potential savings that come from a larger development footprint and something that could be a double loaded corridor and all that, and um, and and taking and I think the city's perspective is is to, can we take that savings and, and pass that on to the end owner or buyer in the form of lower rents um, or lower home ownership prices. But what you're raising is, um, so setting that aside for a moment, and let's say, let's say we're able to achieve that, how does that building look in our neighborhood and how does that integrate into our urban fabric? And I think we can't right. compromise on the design of our neighborhoods and the look and feel of our neighborhoods in, in order to achieve our housing goals. We have to um, uh, protect the essence of why Boston's a great place to live and, uh, and why people want to live here and, and not just grow at all costs. But I might turn it over to Mary to talk a little bit about what you're doing in Charlestown, because I think you're sort of facing a little, a little bit of that, uh, that same challenge and you have a design solution that might work. Okay. Um, but I think first, I, I was thinking of responding to your question um, that, uh, that zoning, I, I guess I was at an ABX panel yesterday um, where Somerville was yes, talking was about their zoning. Yeah. Right? And Renee was there with me. Yeah. Um, and one of the things, uh, I think, as Boston moves into the zoning um, area, um, and certainly what was true of Summer Vision, was that there was a community consensus around where growth would happen. And there was a sort of scale that was understood of what that growth would be. And then there were areas where they said, nope, we really need to protect our character here. And I think Boston is still awaiting that plan, right? Which says, okay, we can, we can grow here. We are, communities are w willing to accept this versus not. And that would really help pave the way for projects to be a little more dense in certain places. Um, and so back to the Charlestown project, um, it's really an economic situation where the, we're replacing 1,100 units of public housing at the Bunker Hill um, projects and um, doing it in mixed market way. So two market rate units um, subsidize one public housing unit. And that requires tripling the density on the site. And this is a very difficult uphill battle with a community, which I can totally understand their, their reluctance to go from a, you know, a place that is sort of three and four stories to six 
um, because that's sort of what the economic fundamental economics of the of the project require. Um, and so, you know, we we will I think as architects and developers and and contractors, um, you know, have to have those difficult conversations. Um, you know, and and then decide at the end of the day where where we're able to accept the density and for what reasons. And again, if it's providing more affordability, I always find that that conversation is at least a little easier mm -hmm. than if it's um, you know all luxury development. And how the design and sort of um, uh, complements the existing neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. So it, there can be added density, but it, it doesn't necessarily need to come with the feel of dramatic density in your neighborhood. And that, can there be many front doors on the street? And there can be a variation in the in the way that the that the facades look, so it doesn't feel like one massive block, but but in fact many homes that are contiguous uh, with the with the existing neighborhood fabric. We are doing our best with the design. Yeah. <laughs> one of the peculiarities about Greater Boston, living in this area, is and, and our one of our other issues of the magazine this this year um, addressed this is that you know we are a, a number of different municipalities, and um, in a in New York City, Somerville would probably be just another borough of New York City, um, but it's its own city with its own. Um, regulations and laws and um, one thing I'd like to see more of I think all of us agree with this but maybe in practice don't do it quite as much is to learn from some of the experiences of these other cities Somerville's a, like about a year maybe ahead of Boston because it just started sooner and they've addressed some of these things and um, you know it's just a opportunity I think the larger opportunity of this whole question um, is to get us to break down some of the silos am among uh, communities and learn from each other. Um, that's my little editorial. Um, where is the microphone? OK, I, I see Don, uh, Dan in the front here. And then, and then this woman in the back, right? OK, thank you. So one of the um, articles in Who this latest you, issue, Daniel Bluestone, I teach at Boston University. Okay, thank you. There's great news, Mark, in, in this idea for how to solve this housing crisis, which is to come up with a system that's more labor intensive and less material intensive. The way to do that is not to be building new housing. It's to take the slide that Tamara had, where we have way um, units that are way too big for the, for the households we're trying to house, and to subdivide them. And, and have, you know, take a typical Boston triple-decker and figure out how to get one additional unit. The roof is in place, the foundation is in place, the utilities are already on the site, and the best way to actually get to the mayor's 53,000 units is not building new construction, oh, no. but, but rehabbing existing buildings in order to take advantage of, of all of that because we know the household size is falling precipitously. We're gonna get down to below two people per unit. And we have a housing stock that's built for six and eight people. So the thing that we shouldn't be doing is looking at new construction. We need to look at something that's labor intensive, gets the work workers, con the carpenters onto the site, really figures out how to work with generic housing types in Boston, and, and crank out that 53,000 units of housing without breaking a sweat. Those are micro units. The roof is in place, the foundation is placed, the walls are there, the utilities are on the site. That's what we ought to be focusing on. And there hasn't been a word said about this on this panel today. And that's a problem. We ought to be thinking about that. You could read more about it in this okay. current issue of Architecture Boston because <laughs> Dan wrote a very compelling piece about this. Any thoughts about this? That, that uh, you know, the, this is also a zoning problem, though. You know, you need to um, figure out how to, how are we going to add a, a fourth floor to a triple decker? It's not adding. It's under the roof. Yeah, it's yeah. taking the first floor of a triple decker and turning it into two apartments rather than one. Well, well you're speaking to is an accessory dwelling unit, right? And so, where can we find within the existing envelope of, of existing housing stock the opportunity to add housing? Um, and that's is certainly a, a, an idea that's on the table. It's something that the Housing Innovation Lab is approaching as one of their pilots. They, they started with, uh, one, one of their first pilots was, uh, was density bonuses. As we add density, can we add more affordable housing? They moved on to working uh, with, with Tamara and the BSA around uh, the um, urban housing unit and compact living and taking that to a pilot to scale. And this is one of the things that we have on tap next. It's something we, we absolutely need to be pursuing. Um, I think we want to be uh, cautious about 
what are the trade-offs and where, where, where are accessory dwelling units most appropriate? Um, where is that added density going to be accepted by, by neighbors and what are the, um, the implications? But we're absolutely having those discussions with the city council now and pursuing some uh, pilot zoning changes that would uh, enable uh, more Bostonians to create accessory dwelling units in their homes. I would just say this, uh, carpenters will break a sweat whether it's renovation or new construction. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this woman back here, right, right next to you now. Thank you. Can't Hi. Hi, my name is Meta Omat, and I want to thank Mark Ehrlich for bringing up the issues of uh, workers and um, the exploitation that is going on uh, of workers, and I think this is one of the dirty little secrets in our business, and with the push to make everything cheaper, you know, I'm, talk I'm not talking about affordable housing in particular, but construction to push construction costs down, I think we're we are exploiting and taking advantage of a lot of people and we're also missing an opportunity to create really, really great middle class jobs. Um, and I think this is something that I just, I need to bring back to the, um, you know, to the world and the state of politics t today. Um, I know myself in the last week, I've been looking for a way that I can, in our own industry, make a difference in terms of social justice. And I just found that article that the Boston Globe published in September, read that article. And this is something I think we should all be very much aware of particularly since we just elected one of the world's worst developers as president, and a lot of the work that he is going to be um, so-called promoting is going to once again be on the backs of uh, illegal immigrants, um, you know, lower class, and, and, and exploiting as well the middle class who he you know, by the way, said he was gonna help. So um, I really think that this is an area I'm so grateful to you for bringing it up, and I think this is a great area for us to all work on as an industry. Thank you. Can I you want to say something? Go ahead. Um, so, I think uh, I mean it's like the the union issue in Boston is like the third rail, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> throw myself on it. Um, but I think one of the the frustrations that I hear, and you know, from my clients, is that you know there's a pretty well understood um, knowledge that when you say you're going to use 100% union, that that's basically adding a 25 to 35% premium to your project, and it's actually really really hard, uh, or it's getting really hard to make the the units work, the the numbers work. And I really appreciate the residential rate. I absolutely applaud you and I would love to see the other unions actually sign on to that because this you know when I mean I I worked on my mother's house in New Hampshire and I pulled the wire myself because you're actually allowed to do that in single family construction and I realized it's like this is not that hard like I would never want to go into a high rise and pull wire myself but in a wood frame construction you can do it and as long as there are ways to um, you know, make sure that folks are getting a living wage. I'm from a union family. What I would, I would like to see the sheet metal workers, the electric workers, the plumbing workers come on board with this and understand that it is a different construction type and that we don't need to be paying really exorbitant rates to do wood frame uh, construction. And then hopefully that, that premium will go down. The other thing I think that we struggle with is um, because it is such a busy time right now is that, you know, and it won't, maybe it won't always be busy, but, um, you know, when I have, I know a lot of architects who say, you know, we're, we're trying to get union um, plumbers and we, we got no bids on our project because everybody's so busy that, you know, we Building we a casino in Everett. Right. <laughs> um, and so I think that, you know, here is where, um, you know, the, I appreciate your comment and the, and the question, but I think that, that this is where, like, the market our, our market, you know, would respond to this demand if we would allow them to, um, you know, and sort of non-union folks would jump in and fill this gap. And yes, we want to make sure that they're well paid and, and have benefits and not be illegal. Mark. Um, well, to welcome you onto the third rail, uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, so, I kind of feel like I can only speak for uh, our organization and I'm reluctant to speak for others. So. As I said, 20 years ago, we recognized that the residential market is a different market uh, in terms of economics and in terms of the workforce and the contractor base and established this rate. And it's worked really well. And we are on most of the sizable uh, residential wood frame projects in, in the city and many of the surrounding communities. Um, 
what has happened in that time, however, is uh, there, there used to be three tiers in the, in the industry in terms of the workforce. There used to be the union sector, the quote unquote legitimate non-union sector, and then the sort of bottom feeders on whatever you want to call them. Exploited. Uh, the folks who don't play by the rules. And at least what's happened in the basic trades, and this is not actually as true in the licensed mechanical trades, but in the basic trades what's happened is that middle has, has disappeared. We've grown, we've taken in a lot of those folks, we've adjusted and I mean we are much larger, our market share is much bigger, the contractor, we signed 49 contractors last year, 48 the year before. Um, and so you have now a two-tiered system. And the problem, at least with respect to our part of the industry, is that um, I can walk you on any wood frame project uh, anywhere in eastern Massachusetts, and I can virtually guarantee you that if the carpenters are not union, they're being paid cash. And that's a sad state of affairs. And that is not an exaggeration. It is The industry has become bifurcated. Uh, and again, that's not true of the licensed trades because licensing uh, um, sort of is a barrier to that. But it's, it's a real problem. Uh, and, um, you know, I appreciate the comments of the... Uh, um, the last speaker, and I, it is a dirty secret. It is not widely known. Uh, Beth Healy's article was really nice. Uh, she spent six months on that, um, talked to dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people, and I think was shocked by what she found out. And I wish more people would do the same thing. Isn't it nice that we can talk, uh, talk across distance here, at, at difference here at, uh, at this session? Um, that was a nice advertisement for the Boston Globe, by the way. Um, <laughs> support your local journalism. Um, I think we have time for one more question, actually, or maybe two. Go ahead. Good morning. Matt Grosshandler with Bald Hill Builders. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is it, uh, just getting over cold. Uh, my, my question or comment has to do with both the point that Tamara just made and, and also Mark's presentation earlier. Uh, Mark, I think your, your presentation was spot on uh, with regard to uh, labor rates being relatively stabilized um, and the... Um, labor not being the driving factor as a result as a result of the rates themselves or the costs themselves. My concern and what we're seeing more of is a rise in cost as a result of limitation mm. of skilled workforce mm. and the younger generations not wanting to get into the trades. And so what we're seeing is a job that in 2010 or five or even 2000 even, we could have done in eight or 10 months is now taking us 14, 16 months as a re result of not having large enough crew sizes or availability of, of skilled workforce. So I guess as we sit here today in today's economy and understanding and looking forward to what's coming, how do we address that? How do we look at either attracting new folks into the industry or somehow changing the way? It can't always be through rate. It's got to be through somehow making it a more attractive yeah. environment. Um, that, uh, that's a really good comment, and, and that's um, – there's a sort of there's sort of myths and realities around that issue as well. Everybody's talking about labor shortages. I am on the side of that fence that says there aren't exactly the labor shortages that people are describing, and I'll tell you why. And and there's also the reality, however, that anytime there's a boom, it's nature, supply and demand costs uh, go up. During the recession, the subcontractors who are in the industry, union, non-union, doesn't matter. Um, really worked at virtually no margin simply to keep the lights on in their buildings and, uh, and to keep going. Uh, the boom came and folks said, time to make up for it. So when you look at the burgeoning prices, uh, you're not seeing the individual workers getting anything uh, of increases, but you're seeing, frankly, the sub subcontractor overhead and profit has gone from zero to very low single digits to double digits. And that's a big driver. And that's a function of a boom. And I, I've never been anywhere where that doesn't happen. Uh, so that's one thing. With respect to the people not being interested in, um, in coming into the trade, I would push back on that. Uh, the whole issue of college debt and student loans and all that, I think, has, uh, has started to move people back towards a, oh, maybe I'll do a uh, earn while you learn uh, trade where uh, I don't end up at the end of it with $100,000 in debt and I'm uh, a barista at Starbucks. Uh, there is, uh, we have right now 1,100 people on our, we have way too many people who want to get into the Carpenters Union than we can take in. And they're more diverse, uh, they're more women, it's, it's a new workforce. I find that exciting and, and a great thing. We have no, I mean, problems 
having people who are attracted to the industry want to come in because they see that, again, as a previous speaker said, there's an opportunity to get into the middle class. That's what we're trying to do in Boston, keep the middle class in Boston, which means you've got to provide jobs that pay middle class wages and benefits. And the construction industry, if you don't have a college degree, the construction industry, the manufacturing is gone, uh, contrary to our new president-elect, um, and certainly around here, it's not coming back. Uh, so the trades end up being, you know, one of the primary options. And we have no problem attracting people. Okay, I want to get one more question, and then you can make whatever okay. closing ideas. There was a, there's a woman here I'd like to, what happened to the mic? You have it. No? <laughs> I'm sorry. Because <laughs> I think this has to be the last question, and then we might have the last words. Hi, my name is Janine Clifford, um, and I also live in the J.P. Roxbury neighborhood um, and have been fortunate enough to live in the city for over a decade now, um, and I really appreciate what you are doing with looking at who's looking for housing, what they need. I think that's a great step in the right direction, having come from, you know, I last about two weeks in my parents' basement, <laughs> and uh, you know, lived in one of those illegal two-bedroom apartments in Alston in several different neighborhoods, and now with a small family living in Jamaica Plain. Speaking about density, though, what are you doing, and how are you closely are you working um, on infrastructure? In your timeline, you said you're ahead of schedule. You found yourself surprisingly ahead of schedule. Infrastructure, namely travel and safety, are far behind that. Um, and we are seeing, you know, personal impact in Jamaica Plain. And these housing units aren't even filled yet. And we're we're saying to ourselves, what are we going to do? The, you know, the police force can't handle it. Fire department can't handle it. The T will fall apart on the tracks with this many people on it. How how are you working with them, and how closely, and and what are your concerns? So okay, I'm, I'm going to ask. <laughs> De yeah, Devin first, and then all, yeah. everybody can just say a couple of closing words, and I, I think that will be the the end Absolutely. of the session. But thank you for that question. It's a great question. The uh, yeah. And I think that's fundamental to the, the work that the, the planning development agency has been leading in, uh, in Jamaica Plain and Roxbury. It's, it in, I think one thing that I can say about um, that planning effort and the dot out planning effort that are very unique is that they're, they're extremely cross-departmental. Um, historically, my department would not be involved uh, in, a, in a planning effort uh, in Boston. It would be the planning department would go out there, we'll make a plan, and then we'll report back to what that means for the transportation department and the housing department and the um, uh, other supporting departments. But the number, they've been at the table the minute every meeting. Um, I, I might uh, object that I think the, the fire department and the police department feel very capable of their ability to, to respond. But I do I agree with you on transportation. Yeah. Crime rates. Yeah. yeah. So I, for those who couldn't hear, her point was about crime rates in in, uh, in Jamaica Plain. I, I'm probably not the uh, the best person to speak I to that, to but uh, <laughs> but I'm 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 sh I'm certain that the the police captain district would have a, a a pretty cogent response. But that's that's what they're. I mean, community policing is what uh, what Boston is is all about, and and it, there are and there are lots of components of infrastructure. Uh, there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem, right? Uh, you, certainly, we could, could not wait to uh, fix every problem with the T uh, and every issue with the fire or police department before we build new housing, and it doesn't work in the opposite way either, right? So that's what really planning is all about, is how can we move um, these processes t uh, together. Um, uh, just as a, as a sort of final uh, the closing thought to a little tangentially related, uh, the solution to Boston's housing woes is not only about growth either. Uh, we, al we also have to find strategies to protect the people who are living here today um, mm -hmm. and, in the and help them stay in the housing that they're living in today. So one of the things that the mayor announced this year is a new office at Housing Stability that opened this July that um, is focused on renters and market rate housing and helping them with the legal services, case advocacy, uh, rent and rearage payments, everything that they need uh, to help them um, to stay in their homes. So it's not, it, uh, while this panel is appropriately focused on growth, that is not the only thing that we're pursuing. Yeah, 
Thank you. I'm just getting the hook here, so um, if we can very quickly, just a couple of last words, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I, w I would say just in terms of uh, the biggest barrier to economic development is infrastructure. Uh, Devin can kick that to the state so and throw them under the bus. Uh, but um, I just think it's important that uh, our mission is to make sure that the people who build the buildings, however we're going to build it, renovation, new construction, uh, are paid fairly, get a uh, decent wage, benefits, uh, so that they can live in the city that they're building. Thank you. I think it's great that we're all here on a panel talking about it. I mean, I think the talking about it is, is, is terrific, and I think in the city of Boston we're doing it. So the more we talk, the more we do, the more we engage on new ideas. Um, out of the mayor's office and everyone else, um, I think is not just a start, it's a continuation of what everybody in the room and everyone in the city and, and the Commonwealth and the country wants to do right now. So doing it here, it's great. Thank you. Very quickly. So, yeah, I just wanted to speak to the, the labor shortage um, issue and modular since that didn't come up as a question. Um, and actually, Mark has, has been over um, many years wanting to have a modular factory in um, Massachusetts, and I, I appreciate his support of that because I think that in terms of factory jobs that are high quality, that are year-round, um, this is something that will attract young workers. Um, and I think the question really is, you know, where would it go? And there's a lot of push for it to be in Boston, but I would argue uh, since I'm at this bully pulpit, that it should go to a gateway city somewhere in the western part of the state along I-90 where you can actually, you know, there is a low cost of living. You can buy a house for $100,000 and you can really support a family on these um, kinds of great jobs. And there are lots of good examples of modular being done in Cambridge, Newton, Malden, Quincy. We're not right now very, it's not very um, accepted here. Um, and I, I guess I, I'd love to see there be um, from the ZBA and others more flexibility to allow that experimentation to happen at the pilot level so that we can see um, whether there are economies um, that can, you know, be built into our, our, you know, this to getting to higher workforce housing uh, numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. This is terrific.